Hey, I'm glad that you've come back to spend 20 minutes with me again today. These are the readings for day number 140. 1 Samuel 5 and 6, Psalm 93, and our second reading in Romans 2. Yesterday we saw the touching way that God revealed to Samuel how to listen for God's voice, and at the same time how he again warned Eli of impending disaster. Eli was incredibly able to recognize the way the Lord works, but at the same time was unconcerned about how God's words applied to him. Let us not be like him. Observe this link to Romans. God's judgment will come to us just as surely as it did to Eli's sons. 1 Samuel 5 After the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they took it from the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again, but the next morning the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. This time his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon or anyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod will step on its threshold. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, We can't keep the ark of the God of Israel here any longer. He is against us. We will all be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. So they called together the rulers of the Philistine towns and asked them, What should we do with the ark of the God of Israel? The rulers discussed it and replied, Move it down the road to Gath. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. But when the ark arrived at Gath, the Lord's heavy hand fell on its men, young and old. He struck them with a plague of tumors, and there was a great panic. So they sent the ark of God to the town of Ekron. But when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they cried out, They are bringing the ark of the God of Israel here to kill us too. The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, Please send the ark of the God of Israel back to its own country, or it will kill us all. For the deadly plague from God had already begun, and great fear was sweeping across the town. Those who didn't die were afflicted with tumors, and the cry from the town rose to heaven. 1 Samuel 6 The ark of the Lord remained in Philistine territory seven months in all. Then the Philistines called in their priests and diviners and asked them, What should we do about the ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. They were told, Send the ark of the God of Israel back with a gift. Send a gift along so the plague will stop. Then, if you are healed, you will know it was his hand that caused the plague. What sort of guilt offering should we send, they asked. And they were told, Since the plague has struck both you and your five rulers, make five gold tumors and five gold rats, just like those that have ravaged your land. Make these things to show honor to the God of Israel. Perhaps then he will stop afflicting you and your gods and your land. Don't be stubborn and rebellious as Pharaoh and the Egyptians were. By the time God was finished with them, they were eager to let Israel go. Now build a new cart and find two cows that have just given birth to calves. Make sure the cows have never been yoked to a cart. Hitch the cows to a cart, but shut their calves away from them in a pen. 
Put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and beside it place a chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors you are sending as a guilt offering. Then let the cows go wherever they want. If they cross the border of our land and go to Beth Shemesh, we will know it was the Lord who brought this great disaster upon us. If they don't, we will know it was not his hand that caused the plague. It came simply by chance. So these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to the cart, and their newborn calves were shut up in the pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors were placed on the cart. And sure enough, without veering off in other directions, the cows went straight along the road toward Beth Shemesh, lowing as they went. The Philistine rulers followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for a fire and killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart and placed them on the large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Beth Shemesh. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and then returned to Ekron that same day. The five gold tumors sent by the Philistines as a guilt offering to the Lord were gifts from the rulers of Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The five gold rats represented the five Philistine towns and their surrounding villages, which were controlled by the five rulers. The large rock at Beth Shemesh, where they set the ark of the Lord, still stands in the field of Joshua as a witness to what happened there. But the Lord killed seventy men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord, and the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? they cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messengers to the people at Kiriath Jerim and told them, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. Like the famous Gettysburg Address, sometimes the noblest thoughts are best expressed with brevity. Psalm 93 The Lord is King. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Holiness, O Lord, aptly adorns your house forever. In yesterday's reading, Paul continued to prove that man is not basically good, which one keeps hearing in Hollywood films and on television. Not only are we sinful, but we tend to be self-righteous, which in itself is sinful. The bad news is compounded in these additional points. A day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, especially for Jews, but also for the non-Jews. Romans 2 You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. 
When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because... You are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin. You are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, especially for the Jews, but also for the non-Jews. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, especially for the Jews, but also for the non-Jews. For God does not show favoritism. So people who already know the law and break it are just the same as those who have never heard about the law and commit sin. Sinners who don't know the law will be destroyed. Similarly, people who already know the law and commit sin will be judged according to the law. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even non-Jews, who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. You who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with Him. You know what He wants. You know what is right because you have been taught by His law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are so certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, But do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say, the non-Jews blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than the uncircumcised non-Jews. And if the non-Jews obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised non-Jews who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Let's pray together. O Lord, 
Thank you for the picture of holiness that we see today. As the psalm says, O Lord our God, you are our King. Your holy reign, O Lord, will last forever and ever. You are holy, Lord. And that's why the 70 men from Beth Shemesh died when they looked into the Ark of the Covenant. That was forbidden for them in your law. O oh Lord, yes, they were circumcised. But their circumcision was of no value because they broke your law. And we, circumcised or uncircumcised, male or female, are all alike in this one thing. We are sinners, and we all need a Savior. Lord, in another place you speak about circumcised hearts. And that is the change of life that you give to believers, to people who fully believe in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we pray that you would give us changed hearts, circumcised hearts, that we might live according to your Spirit and glorify Christ Jesus.